Anyway, is everybody ready for Christmas? I'm never ready. If you'll take your bulletin or you can take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 1.18. I'm going to read our scripture. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly or privately. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, and that's Isaiah, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Uh, El, at the end, is uh, one of the names of God. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Let's say a short prayer here. Father, uh, I ask that you would be with me as I present this message. And that it would bless your people. And draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. On his way home from church, a pastor's young son asked his father, How do you spell God? The pastor was thrilled that his son was showing signs of spiritual interest. He spelled out G-O-D and anxiously waited for his son's next theological question. And he then asked, how do you spell Zilla? <laughs> Did everybody hear that? First it was how do you spell God? Then the theoretical, the theological question, how do you spell Zilla? If I have to explain any more, I'm just going to leave now. I really enjoyed that one. Being a pastor, I would. Okay, I know this is an unusual beginning to a Christmas message, but I think that some people think it's easier to believe in Godzilla than it is to believe in God. But at the same time, some of these same people come to church this time of year looking for God, just in case he is real. And church is a good place to start looking. So I like to take the opportunity during the holidays to touch on the subject of the existence of God especially since the second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Son, took the form of a human being when he came on that first Christmas. This we speak of as the incarnation. Uh, he became flesh and dwelt among us, became a human being. Someone said that the door, the door of history hinges on the birth of this special baby. And there is so much in the story that is just saturated with God's grace, uh, his undeserved favor and provision. So I've called the message Christmas Graces, and I've listed five of these. The first was Mary, Jesus' mother. Look at the first verse of our scripture, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. You may remember that Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, who told her 
that she was greatly favored by God and that she would have a very special child. He would be the son of the Most High God and she would call him Jesus and he will reign on the throne of his father David forever. Mary asked, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. Gabriel said the Holy Spirit would come upon her and through God's power she would conceive this son so that he would be called the Son of God. Mary's response was that she was the handmaid of the Lord, so let it be done to her according to his word. Submission to God's will. It was God's grace that Mary was humble and godly. She who would be the mother of Jesus. Later she told Elizabeth, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his handmaiden. Mary and Joseph were betrothed, we're told. And in Jewish custom, they were considered legally married and must be faithful to one another until their marriage was consummated and still remain faithful to each other, but uh, at the end of the betrothal period, the groom would ceremoniously go with his friends to the bride's house and take her away to his home, where the final celebration took place. After the Annunciation, which is what Gabriel's announcement to Mary uh, is called, uh, that she would have this child, uh, she went to the hill country of Judea to visit her relative, Elizabeth. We aren't told why, but she was there for three months, then returned to Nazareth, where Joseph waited to marry her. But there was a problem. Before they came together, it says, which is an expression for marital intimacy, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, it says with child of the Holy Spirit was information for Matthew's readers. Uh, that's something that he was informing his readers of. It wasn't how she was found with child by folks in Nazareth. There was a film that came out a few years ago called The Nativity Story. Anybody see that film? It's pretty good. Uh, after Mary's three months away, she comes riding into Nazareth in the back of an ox cart. Joseph learns that she is coming. Everybody's saying, Mary's coming. And he runs to greet her, but then he sees the bump she now has. And his expression is one of awful surprise and apprehension. And the looks between them are those of hurt and sadness. Mary is with child. What is Joseph to do? This is the second grace of Christmas. It was grace that Joseph was honorable and decent. Look at verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. To say that Joseph was a just or righteous man is to say that he took the law seriously. He was a devout keeper of the law. One version says he was an upright man. He was an honorable man. But at the same time, he didn't want to publicly disgrace Mary. We can believe he loved her. And to openly accuse her would have possibly been very dangerous. The law called for stoning her, though it wasn't com commonly practiced at that time. It still could have been. But if not, she would have been forever disgraced in her hometown. The expression put her away was the wording of a legal action called a writ of divorce which the husband presented to the wife. And Joseph could do that and still be keeping the law. And he wouldn't be marrying 
an unfaithful wife. But the next verse informs us that he was only thinking about these things when something amazing happened. God intervened. And we should note here that Matthew wrote to Jewish readers. Uh, there are angels and Old Testament prophecies and the like. And we'll see, we'll see that. And Matthew is the gospel of the king. The angel greets Joseph as Joseph, son of David. He was a descendant of Israel's great king and in the royal line. And this son to be born would be in that line as well. The third grace of Christ Christmas was grace that God was helpful and romantic. Was helpful and romantic. Look at verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I know it sounds strange to call God romantic, but he is. He invented marriage and romantic love. I got to hear a love story this week, and uh, many of us could tell some. Uh, God intervened to keep Joseph and Mary together, kind and godly human parents to our Lord. But can you imagine Joseph's joy to find that his Mary is pure and truthful about her conception? And furthermore, the angel revealed to him the purpose of this holy conception. The son she will bring forth will be named Jesus from the Old Testament name Joshua or Yeshua, which means Savior God. Savior God for or because he will save his people from their sins. Not from the tyranny of Rome as the Jews hoped, but the tyranny of sin, which is the great destroyer. The angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. You will name him Jesus. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. There are those who would perpetuate Mary's virginity, that she was always a virgin, even after uh, Jesus' birth. But uh, scripture tells us that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Sounds romantic to me, for those two. Um, Joseph was a true hero in the Christmas story. And I came across this from the Daily Bread back in 2007. It's called The Forgotten Man. Amid all the Christmas activities, one man is often forgotten. No, I don't mean the person whose birthday we're celebrating, although we often fail to give Jesus first place as he deserves. We don't usually forget him. I'm talking about Joseph. The man God trusted so much that he placed his son in his home uh, to love and nurture. What a responsibility. Joseph truly is the forgotten man in the Christmas story. Yet this task was, his, was an important component of God's incredible plan. As we read the story of the birth of Jesus, we find that Joseph was just, righteous, merciful, protective and courageous but most of all he was obedient <clears throat> when the angel told him to take Mary as his wife he obeyed and when the angel told him to flee to Egypt with Mary and Jesus he did just as Mary was carefully chosen to bear the son of God Joseph was deliberately chosen to provide for his young wife and the Christ child 
and trusting God, Joseph followed through on everything God asked him to do. What is God asking of you today? Are you willing to commit yourself to do whatever he wants you to do? We can learn much about obedience from Joseph, the forgotten man of Christmas. It matters not the path on earth my feet are made to trod. It only matters how I live, obedient to God. The proof of our love for God is our obedience to the commands of God. Look at verse 24. So all this was done, no, 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. Just as the angel told him to. And he didn't have relations with Mary until she had brought forth Jesus as her firstborn son. Two other sons, brothers of Jesus, I should say half-brothers, wrote books of the Bible. James, whom Paul called the Lord's brother in Galatians 1.19, and Jude, who humbly called himself the brother of James, not the brother of Jesus. But Joseph was a godly and gracious family man. The fourth grace was in the prophecy. The prophecy was heavenly and happy. Look at verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Do you, do you remember how I said at the beginning that some people think it's hard to believe in God? But some come to church this time of year looking for God, just in case he is real. I think that because of that, it's important at these times to talk about the existence of God. Does God really exist? Does he really exist? In Romans 1.20, Paul wrote that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So men are without excuse. This is the argument of divine design. You go for a walk, and you find a watch on the sidewalk, and you examine it, you take the cover off, and see these complicated mechanisms inside that make it work. And you know that it had to be designed by someone, and that someone made it. It didn't make itself. How did all this get here? How did it get here? Sir Isaac Newton was professor of mathematics at Cambridge University from 1669 to 1701. He is said to be one of the greatest scientists of all time. His most far-reaching achievement was the formulation of the universal law of gravitation, explaining the motion and behavior of the planets. Newton was also a fine Christian. It is said that one day he was sitting at his desk working when one of his atheist friends came to see him. In his room to one side was a, a beautifully made orrery, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it this way, or orrery, it was a clockwork model used to demonstrate the movement of the planets around the sun, a model of our solar system. During the conversation, the atheist was admiring this complicated, beautifully crafted machine. And finally, he asked Newton who made it. Newton said, oh, no one. It just happened. <laughs> Why did he say that? Did this universe just happen? 
did a snow just happen? Or the human hand? Did you know that a giraffe has a 50 pound heart so it can pump blood up its long neck to its brain? Do you know that? Who planned that? God is real. But best of all, God is not just out in space uh, looking at us from a distance. He is God with us. And he is our Savior God. Yeah, the meaning of Jesus' other name. The Bible tells us that God loves us and gave his son to save us. So we will never perish. But that is something that has to be believed. And the one who did it must be accepted into your life so he can save you. Have you taken that step? Have you invited him into your life? Have you put your faith in him? You know, Christmas is a good time to do that. You can even let it be today. All you need to do is just get with God and have a conversation with him. Tell him that you believe Jesus died for you. And, uh, and he wants to be in your life and to guide your steps and to show you the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to know him. Um, I had a quote about that, about not knowing him is not much help in a strong wind or something like that. You know, it's, just to believe there's a God out there is not enough. You need to believe that Jesus is your Savior and came for you. Let's sing our last song. And if you would like to talk to me about that after the service and, and uh, learn how you can be sure you know Jesus and that he has saved you, let's talk about it. If you don't like me, talk to uh, <laughs> Becky about it. <laughs> and here's another wonderful Christmas song. What child is this? Yeah. 
we acknowledge you. We acknowledge your love. We acknowledge your gift. We acknowledge your sacrifice. We acknowledge your salvation. Father, I pray that we would believe and accept and receive all that you have for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name.